Hello, I'm Ron Vale, and in this lecture, I'd like to discuss with you how to choose the right microscope technique. So, if you're a newcomer to microscopy, it may seem like there's a jungle of different choices out there, uh, all kinds of techniques and various acronyms, and uh, it may seem quite daunting to decide which type of microscopy technique to use. Now, in this course, we've discussed these different techniques one by one, and uh, illustrate in detail how they work. And what I'd like to do today is really just give you a, a broad overview of how you would go about uh, choosing between the different microscopy techniques available to you. Now, in making that choice, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, what kind of biological information are you trying to gather? What question are you trying to answer? And um, Based upon that, you, you can think about what kind of image data do I need to answer that question. And that will, in part, be the most important decision in dictating what microscopy technique will be the most relevant for answering your problem. A second issue is, is pragmatics. What do you have available? What's in your lab or in your department or in your building? Um, and you may have to make some adjustments based upon uh, what kind of equipment is available um, and uh, guide your research based upon that. In some cases, you may have a very specific need and no equipment in your particular institution. In that case, you may consider even setting up a collaboration or visiting a lab uh, to do the kind of microscopy that you need to do. Uh, and thirdly, uh, you also should think about in advance how you might uh, potentially analyze your image, because that will also uh, may influence how you collect the data. And microscopy is changing dramatically in recent years. It's not just a technique to uh, generate beautiful images, but uh, those images contain a lot of quantitative information that can be extremely important for your being to answer a particular biological question. So you should think about quantitation even at the very beginning of uh, your thinking about your, your choices and your project. Now, I also want to say that you don't always need to have the most expensive microscope out there to answer a biological problem. And in fact, uh, when I started my lab at UCSF, um, uh, this was the workhorse microscope of our laboratory. It was a very uh, simple uh, dark field microscope, uh, just a simple condenser one objective lens, and there was a camera atop it. Simple microscope that you could pick up with one hand. And, uh, but this microscope was, in fact, a very uh, good microscope and technique for imaging uh, microtubules uh, and how they were moved by motor proteins. And, in fact, uh, this particular image here uh, uh, on the cover cell was generated uh, with this uh, microscope here. Um, so. Uh, first decision tree we may want to think about is whether you want to use transmitted light or fluorescence. And this is perhaps a, a, a little bit of a gross generalization, but uh, transmitted light on one hand can be a very good technique for measuring uh, cell behavior. It's very non-perturbing, uh, can be done with long-term time-lapse imaging, um, and, you know, a, a very simple, uncomplicated Te technique. On the other hand, uh, if you want to measure a specific molecule in the cell or specific organelle, then you, you, you need a molecular marker. And for that, you have to go to fluorescence. Um, but let's discuss transmitted light first. So as I already mentioned, the big advantage of transmitted light is there's no pre special preparation needed. You can just take your, your cells and image them right away. You don't need to encode uh, do any molecular biology or genetics to encode uh, GFP on a particular gene. Um, and also, <clears throat> in general, transmitted light is less damaging to the specimen uh, than fluorescence excitation. So it can be very good for long-term observation of cells uh, and keeping them happy uh, without any damage. And this just shows an example of a time-lapse movie of of cells, phase uh, contrast microscopy, of, of cells closing in on 
um, a wound, a scratch made in a tissue culture cell. And this time, time lapse movie provides a lot of information on the cell behavior uh, and how they migrate uh, uh, in this special circumstance. Um, and this shows another case of dark field microscopy, which I alluded to before. This is work by Hotani in the, in the 1980s, where he used this to image uh, the growth um, of individual and shrinkage of individual microtubules. Um, and this was the first time that microtubule dynamic instability was imaged live under a microscope. So you can see in a very simple sample like this, uh, transmitted light uh, uh, dark field can be very powerful. Um, so, as I said, in many cases you have to go to fluorescence to see a specific uh, marker or protein in the cell. And then uh, there are many choices of different kinds of fluorescence microscopy. And in terms of the decision tree here, you first have to think about what kind of specimen you have. Do you have uh, a thick specimen or a thin specimen? Because um, different types of microscopy techniques are going to be appropriate depending on the depth of penetration that you have to uh, go uh, to see your, your, your objects, your, your fluorescence. Um, and the other question you might want to ask is, are you looking at a, a living sample or a fixed sample? If you're looking at something fixed, you don't have to worry about damage. You don't have to worry about time of acquisition. But that's very different if you're looking at dynamics in living cells. So you have to think about how fast you acquire the images uh, so you can see the dynamics in the cell. And you do have to be uh, potentially cautious about cell damage uh, through fluorescence excitation. So uh, the easiest type of fluorescence is epifluorescence. So let's consider that first. Now, the advantages of epifluorescence are that it's the very simplest technique out there. It's low cost. You don't need any lasers. Uh, it's a very simple uh, technique to use. Um, so if you can use epifluorescence, uh, you know, this is a very good solution. Now, there are some disadvantages. Um, because epifluorescence, in epifluorescence, you have uh, fluorescence, out-of-focus fluorescence, and that contributes to kind of this background haze in your image. And therefore, in your, um, in your plane of focus, you may have kind of, your, your signal may not be that good because of all, all of the unwanted out of focus background fluorescence. And second of all, the epifluorescence is, um, you know, penetrates through the entire specimen. And again, that fluorescence excitation can uh, damage the cell, not only in the plane of focus, but in out of focus planes as well. But in many cases, it's, it's perfectly good. So here's an example of uh, an application that we used epifluorescence, which was to image uh, the mitotic spindle. And in this particular case, we wanted to image uh, many, many samples. In fact, this was uh, an RNAi screen of the entire Drosophila genome, where we knocked down individual genes one by one in 96 well plates and looked whether that gene uh, knockdown affected the shape of the spindle. But in this case, we could use uh, fixed cells. These are fixed Drosophila cells. We could stain them uh, with antibodies for uh, tubulin in green, uh, the centrosome in red, and DNA in blue. And we could get all the information that we needed uh, to see if that gene knockdown affected mitotic spindle shape. And this was a, a pretty simple technique that allowed us uh, to get all the information we wanted. Now, in some cases, you may also want to get more information or better clarity out of your epifluorescent image. And in that case, you may want to think about a technique, which is a computational uh, technique, really, which is deconvolution microscopy. And this is a way of uh, computationally removing uh, kind of the contributions of out-of-focus uh, fluorescent light. And this involves taking a z-stack of images from your sample and then uh, doing a computational correction uh, to remove the out-of-focus light. And one advantage here is that hardware-wise, it's actually quite simple. It just requires an epifluorescent microscope. And the only special piece of hardware that's required is a motorized z-axis stepper. So you can get uh, take different uh, z-sections images of different z-sections through your specimen, uh, which is needed to do uh, deconvolution microscopy. 
But the one thing you will need, which is special, is the software that can do this uh, computational uh, correction and sharpen the in-focus uh, light computationally. So this may involve um, uh, purchasing, uh, potentially, a commercial software package to do that. Uh, and this just shows an example of an epifluorescent image of a cell where you can see it's, it's a little bit hazy and uh, not that crisp. And then after uh, uh, deconvolution, you can see that uh, the image is it's, it's much sharper and, and crisper uh, after this uh, computational method. So an other class of getting good uh, optical sections is, uh, or good sectioning, is using optics uh, and, and not a computer. And there are several ways in which one can do optical sectioning. Uh, most of them really pragmatically are done using lasers. So that adds some extra cost to the microscopy. Um, and there are several different ways that you can use lasers to do sectioning. Um, and it, it depends upon the, the depth of your specimen. So in some cases, you may have an object or specimen where, where, where what you want to image is right at the cover slip surface. And for this, total internal uh, reflection uh, fluorescence microscopy is a very powerful technique. Uh, it doesn't allow you to pe penetrate very far. It's usually good to within 200 nanometers or so of the cover slip surface. But if your object is in that regime, it's very good. Um, but if you have a thicker sample, like a cell or even a section of a tissue, you then may have to go to a pinhole microscopy. So these uh, techniques are, for example, um, uh, point scanning uh, confocal microscopy uh, or, or line scanning confocal microscopy or another technique which is spinning disk microscopy. And if you have a, a still thicker sample, uh, such as a, a piece of a tissue, a piece of a, a brain section, for example, in this case, you would have to think about another technique, which is two-photon microscopy. And <clears throat> in some cases, if you have an extremely thick uh, specimen, for example, an entire brain of a mouse, um, there is a method for doing that I'll mention later, which is actually a physical sectioning technique, which is called... Uh, array tomography. Now first let's uh, talk about uh, turf microscopy. So this just shows an example of <clears throat> how powerful turf can be. In this case we're looking at uh, microtubules in a Xenopus egg extract by epifluorescence. And you can see everything is, is very uh, fuzzy. It's very hard to see anything. There's a tremendous amount of just general blur from out of focus fluorescence here. And now if we look at the same specimen by turf microscopy, we can look at the behavior of microtubules right at the cover slip surface in uh, much more detail, much better signal to noise, and we can see uh, individual microtubule uh, behavior here. So this just shows, if you're in that regime, how close to the cover slip, how powerful turf microscopy can be. Now in a way, uh, tur turf is not only good for looking at cells or extracts, but it, you really can think of it as a very general tool for any kind of biochemistry that could be visualized on um, a glass surface. And there are all kinds of creative ways now of doing biochemistry using microscopy techniques and turf. So even classical biochemical techniques such as immunoprecipitations, um, which are done in bulk solution, uh, recently have even been done now at the single molecule level or single immunoprecipitation level uh, using turf microscopy. And um, in this case, an antibody that's used for the immunoprecipitation is attached to a glass cover slip and used to pull out uh, a molecular complex from a cell or an extract uh, with, uh, so at some point, a fluorescent tag on one of the molecules. And, uh, in, in this case, each of these individual spots that you see here corresponds to an individual immunoprecipitation reaction. And you can even uh, look at the type of complexes that are, are formed um, uh, at a single molecule level using this particular technique. And this is just a control here without any antibody on the surface for the immunoprecipitation. Even the new revolution of DNA sequencing is also effectively involving imaging and uh, turf microscopy. 
many of the more recent um, uh, next generation sequencing techniques, such as the ones recently developed by Illumina, which allow you to do very high throughput uh, sequencing, involve um, uh, hybridizing fluorescent DNA to oligos that are attached to the surface and then using a visual microscopy uh, readout um, as a way of uh, getting the DNA sequence information. So uh, now let's go to the uh, methods of uh, confocal microscopy. And a decision point here may be whether to use uh, spinning disk or point scanning confocal microscopy. So spinning disk is um, a particularly powerful technique uh, for live cell imaging and fast acquisition. The reason is that the images here are acquired by a camera um, and the camera, you can run the camera as fast as your camera can run and you can use very sensitive cameras to detect very low level fluorescence. Um, so if you have a relatively thin sample under 30 microns, typical of most cells, and you want to measure something live, dynamic, fast, and have very little also cellular damage, then spinning disk microscopy may be a very good technique. Um, if you have a slightly thicker specimen, uh, however, uh, point uh, scanning confocal microscopy may be better. In general also, point scanning confocal microscopy tends to be better for fixed tissue. Uh, it tends to be slower than spinning disk. Uh, but if you have fi a fixed specimen, there's really no limitation and time in terms of acquiring the whole field of view. Um, it also tends to be, have, because it focuses a very intense laser at an individual point, tends to be more photo damage than spinning disc confocal. So again, you might have to think about that. Again, less of a concern for a fixed sample. Um, and it also has some advantages, such as measuring uh, dynamics of molecules in cells uh, by the technique called uh, fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching. And you can combine that by bleaching a very defined point in your sample using the point scanning confocal microscope. And after the bleach, then go back and acquire an image of the specimen to see how fast that photo bleach has recovered. So that's a particularly good use of point scanning confocal. There are other ways of generating uh, also uh, optical sectioning. And kind of an interesting uh, recent technique is light sheet microscopy, where instead of having the light travel through the uh, objective lens, uh, you actually have the light traveling uh, perpendicular to the optical axis. Now, this is very good because it doesn't illuminate. It only illuminates the specimen in one focal plane. It doesn't uh, illuminate it uh, below or above. Uh, that sectioning plane. So that means you don't have uh, light damage uh, above or below the uh, field of observation. And um, so th because it has very little photo damage, it's made it a very good technique for imaging processes that uh, occur in complex systems such as uh, embryos, for example. And it also allows for very uh, fast acquisition as well. So um, I'll just show you an example of a, of a beautiful movie done with this technique of um, a zebrafish embryo here. Uh, and this is from the, the Stelzer group, uh, labeling uh, uh, DNA here with a GFP histone. So you can here watch uh, individual cells in this zebrafish embryo uh, over time as this uh, embryo develops. And you have this beautiful single cell clarity in this uh, uh, still fairly big embryo. You can see all the details of embryogenesis here. Um, so in some cases, however, you may, um, may need to even go deeper into your specimen. Uh, and in this case, a particularly powerful technique is uh, multi-photon microscopy, or most frequently employed as two-photon microscopy. And this just shows a, uh, a nice comparison of the two uh, done many years ago by John White uh, and his colleague. Uh, and it, it shows a uh, comparison of a, a same sample in confocal microscopy uh, using a pinhole or two-photon microscopy. And you can see you get 
uh, much better uh, penetration depth with two photon. Now, the exact depth of penetration is um, not solely dependent upon the optics. It also depends uh, quite a bit on the particular tissue and how much that tissue will scatter light. Um, so that may dictate how far you could go, but in all cases, uh, two photon is a preferable technique for imaging uh, deeper into uh, tissues. Now, in, in some cases, maybe two photon is not even enough. You'd like to create, for example, a, a whole um, uh, image of a big t piece of tissue, part of a brain, or even maybe an entire brain, uh, like what Steve, Stephen Smith and his colleagues are interested in doing. And they solved this problem not by using optical sectioning, but using physical sectioning. So to take uh, a big tissue like a brain and optically sectioning into very small slivers, even down to like 50 nanometers in size, and these slivers of tissue you can now uh, stain for various uh, um, uh, cellular markers, and you can just image those uh, slivers by um, conventional epifluorescence microscopy. And then you can just put all, the, all of these um, slices together computationally to create uh, this beautiful uh, movie that you see here uh, penetrating uh, deeper and deeper uh, into a mouse brain, all derived from uh, physical sections that have been uh, intercalated together. Uh, so, finally, we also discussed in this course super-resolution microscopy. Uh, of course, this is a very new, exciting technique in light microscopy. Uh, there are several different methods that are out there. Um, and uh, while you shouldn't take these numbers as absolute, this gives you kind of a, a rough guideline of the resolution improvement uh, from some of these super-resolution techniques. Um, and they're still not quite at the real uh, molecular level. Of course, that one has to uh, go to um, cryo-electron microscopy, but still an enormous improvement. But I think a major decision, because these techniques are still, they're more expensive, they're still harder to implement, it's important to think uh, if you have a problem that is really well suited to the resolution improvement that you uh, see here from these techniques. So I'll give you one example of an interesting biological problem that did require an improvement of resolution, but was still within uh, the boundary of what super-resolution could do. And this is um, uh, analysis of the centrosome. So this is an organelle in cells that nucleates microtubules. So they're uh, nucleating proteins, and the microtubules grow off of the centrosome. And uh, these are important for organizing the microtubule cytoskeleton. And if you put a fluorescent marker on um, uh, a GFP-tagged centrosomal protein, you look at it by wide field, uh, it's not very impressive. It's just a little round blob. But if one looks at it by structured illumination microscopy, which you know, can give you a two to three fold improvement in the resolution, uh, as was done in this study, uh, by David Agard's lab, they could now see interesting structure from this GFP tag protein. It's not just a ball. It actually has this donut-shaped structure. And when they looked at actually several different centrosomal uh, proteins using GFP tagging and structural illumination, you now can see that you, you now get molecular details showing that they're not all in identical locations. Uh, and they could begin to define uh, different uh, molecular uh, localizations for centrosomal proteins that was, that were, was never uh, known before. Um, so in addition to optical techniques that we've just talked about, I think an, another important thing that's been an enormous advance in microscopy and biology is coming up with new creative ways of measuring activities, biochemistry that's going on in cells. And, measuring these events with light. So in this case, you need to have some kind of reporter that you can introduce into the cell that, in response to some uh, kind of change in the environment of the cell or biochemical activity, will produce a readout of light. Um, so this may require both designing new kinds of molecules or sensors or uh, 
genetic proteins. And there's so many examples of this, of different kind of sensors that are being designed. But you may want to think about designing your own sensor or implementing a specific sensor that someone else has made. So this just shows uh, work from Adam Cohen's lab of uh, a new reporter that they made, which was based upon a microbial rhodopsin. And in this particular case, they engineered it so it would be a reporter of voltage inside of a cell. And what you're seeing here is a rat hippocampal neuron. And this bright flash is the readout of light when uh, the voltage, when there was an action potential in this neuron that changed the voltage of the cell. Uh, and there's a re- uh, and the sensor reports on this voltage change, as you see here. And this could be an incredibly exciting technology now to put inside of a, a, you know, a, a mouse and get readout of how neurons behave uh, in their natural environment uh, and, and actually watch the action potentials that they were firing, not with electrophysiology, um, but with uh, light. Um, so finally, I'd like to uh, talk about how to analyze images. Um, because in addition to the optics, I think it's very important that uh, if you're getting into microscopy, that you not only learn about the optics, but you also learn to use image analysis software. And we discussed image J in this course. Um, and uh, because the, the reason for this is that um, in addition to just producing a nice image, it's very important to extract as much quantitative information out of that image as possible. Uh, and this is becoming easier and easier to do as well. Uh, this just shows the Image J program that we used. Uh, and, and here we recorded a movie of a, a single kinesin molecule moving along a microtubule track. The software now is able to identify in this image uh, the single points of light that represent the molecule. And now we can ask the, the program here to track that molecule uh, position of that molecule over time so we can get uh, an XY uh, position readout. And from this, we can extract a lot of quantitative information, like how fast that kinesin molecule is moving or if it changes its behavior in motion. And the main thing to say is that every kind of question that you want to answer uh, with microscopy, we'll probably have a different type of way of uh, approaching it using analysis. So there's not one analysis that will fit all kinds of images, and you'll have to go out there and do some research about uh, what kind of uh, image analysis best suits the kind of quantitation that you want to do. So in conclusion, um, yes, uh, it's very exciting time in microscopy today. There's so many different uh, techniques that are out there. Uh, but all these techniques are really to your benefit of being able to look at living samples uh, in, in many different ways. And um, if you get to know these different techniques, it won't seem like a jungle to you anymore. And rather, it will allow you to uh, uh, produce fascinating images and get information on how living systems work. Thank you very much.